if you thought 2023 was a lot of change, 2024 is going to be even more. And I think that what's going to happen, and I'm already starting to see this, is that change management is going to become the thing that leadership has to deal with. Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Tears from Tudor Collegiate Strategies, and you're about to check out the latest episode of the Mission of Mission podcast, a show that's designed to help higher ed become better recruiters, communicators, marketers, and managers. Each week, I'll introduce you to an industry leader or difference maker who will share helpful advice, tips, and strategies that will help you grow professionally and personally. Mission of Mission is part of the Enrollify podcast network. I'm excited to share my latest candid conversation, so let's get started. Hey everybody, it's Jeremy Tears, and this is episode 33 of the Mission Admissions Podcast. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of having lunch again with somebody who I consider a legend and think is one of the most respected and consistent voices in the higher ed marketing and enrollment management circles, Bart Kaler. Bart is the founder of Kaler Solutions, which is an ed marketing agency here in the Indianapolis area. And Bart is also the host of one of the top rated marketing podcasts out there. Highly recommend you listen to The Higher Ed Marketer if you're not already doing so. Welcome to the show, my friend. I'm glad we could finally do this. Jeremy, it's a pleasure to be here. I am as well. So you obviously have a lot going on, and that is one of the things at our recent lunch meeting we were chatting about. I know I've been asked probably more questions in the last 12 to 24 months than I easily was in the first eight to nine years in my current role of just time management related things. You're running a company podcast, your family, like talk to us about time management, Bart. How do you organize your day? You know, one of the things that I learned a long time ago, which I'm, I'm glad I had really good mentors and, and people encouraged me to surround myself with people, you know, that, that could help me do things. And, um, you know, even though I've run my own company and, and I, I have a unique model because I am the only employee, but I've got about 35 subcontractors that I work with on a regular basis. That includes project managers and executive assistants and creatives and developers, all, all kinds. What I have discovered is that um, I spent some time really trying to figure out what are my gifts and what am I really good at and what brings me passion. And a lot of times, if you can identify that and then you delegate everything else that doesn't fit under that bucket, uh, time management gets to be a little bit better. Uh, it's still hard. I mean, as you know, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, having six to eight hours of meetings a day is is challenging to anybody. And and then, you know, so I've really been leaning into my team this past, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months to really help me, ha- have them help me organize my time in a better way. So a lot of times it, it, for me, it's getting to the point of asking for help, delegating help, and uh, and then recognizing where does my energy come from? Because, you know, if I have a day where I have, uh, you know, eight meetings that drain me, I'm spent. I mean, I, I couldn't do another thing. But if I have a day where I'm very energized by some things that I've done, you know, I can I can get some things done that might have taken me longer. And so I think it's more of a a way of looking instead of how to fit everything in, how to fit in the things that only you can do that bring you energy and, and then figure out how to delegate and assign and ask for help on those other things. I love the fact that you hit on things that tie in with your mission, things that you enjoy doing. And it's funny, I had a conversation with a colleague of mine, Mandy Green, the other day, and she has this concept she calls magic time. And so I've started referring to magic time when I do trainings and and what magic time is Bart is some people are morning people, some people are afternoon people. And it's figuring out to your point, if I have eight meetings and I'm a morning person, I'm probably not doing a significant project after those eight meetings in the afternoon. And it's exactly, I'm finding a lot of people just aren't thinking along those lines. And it's more, I just have a huge long list. There's really no rhyme or reason why I start picking things off the list. I'm going to try to get the whole list done, which for 99.9% of the population is completely unrealistic. Exactly. One of the other things we talked a lot about when we were at Lunch Bart is is AI, and it's definitely integrating more and more into the world of higher education. I look at you as somebody who definitely is ahead of the curve, not only in the fact that I think you've gone down, as we discussed, you know, a rabbit hole per se, and really educated yourself and become knowledgeable. And you're actually a practitioner now, and you're you're incorporating some of these tools. So I get a lot of questions, and I know the audience would love to hear your take on this. 
if they're really new to the AI space and they're familiar, but not really familiar, like where should someone start in terms of educating themselves just about the different AI tools that are available? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. And, and before we even go down that path, I, I always like to make sure that everybody understands that, you know what, I might look like I'm, you know, miles ahead, but keep in mind, ChatGPT just celebrated its first birthday at the end of November. So, I mean, to think that, oh man, I'm so far behind in AI, you're really not. I mean, we're still, we're still so early in all of this. Now, granted, there's been a lot of people that have kind of taken the, taken the plunge and kind of learned. I, I spent some, you know, quality time kind of either taking some courses on Coursera or for me, just experimenting is the best way and, and kind of figuring it out as I, as I go along. And so one of the things I've been telling a lot of people first, recognize that it's a tool. And so anytime that you have a new tool, you just have to kind of put in the reps and get used to using it. And so I think so many people kind of confuse AI as that, oh, it's going to take my job or, you know, all these different things. It's, it's, it's kind of over it's computers. It's, they don't understand that, you know what, it's, it's not much more different than spell check in your, in your Microsoft word. It's just, it's another tool and it's, it's to, you know, to your best interest to basically learn it. So one of the tax tasks that I encourage everybody, if you're just brand new starting it out, go to chat.openai.com. That's the, that's the chat GPT. Sign up for a free account and then just ask a question to say, help me do a meal plan for my family for the next week. It's simple. It's, it's not anything that's going to be threatening to you. And, and then before you close that chat, just say, and ask me questions to help you do your best job. And it's going to start asking you, do you know, you know, do you have kids? Do they have any allergies? Do they have food they don't like? It's going to walk you through how to prompt. And at the end of it, you'll be able to walk away and say, wow, this is pretty amazing. This, I, ha- I accomplished something with this tool. I know that on my team, when we, when I first started encouraging everyone to start, you know, playing with it, uh, you know, my chief of staff, Hannah, she, she came back one weekend. She was like, after one weekend, she was like, Hey, I started doing the open AI stuff. And I, I just kind of messed around with meal planning and I was blown away. That's where she learned. She, she kind of got excited about it after she saw how it could change and make her life better by engaging with this tool. And so I think that before you kind of sit down and I know a lot of people have started and they're like, you know, I tried it. It's nothing that big. You know, I, I said, you know, write me a blog post about, you know, financial aid and I wasn't too impressed with it. Well, it's all in the prompt and it takes practice to learn how to prompt. And we did an AI summit recently and had a lot of experts in higher education kind of learn, teach us how to do the prompt. And, you know, Jamie Hunt was on there and Artist could do from Element 451 and several other uh, leading thought leaders in the, in the space around AI. And a lot of it was just kind of, you know, teaching people how to do the prompts, how to, how to practically do the things. And so, again, it's a tool, get in, put in your reps. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are playing with it, reach out and talk to them and just say, hey, what's the best thing that we could do? And, and I'm happy to take any questions from anyone as well. Well, I'm back to managing your day, right? It's something you just have to be intentional about. And yeah. that continues to be something that things I end up talking about a lot or get asked about a lot. You know, Jeremy, why is this not working? Why? I'm like, well, how intentional are you about, yeah. well, I do it when I can. And I'm like, okay, well, then it's going to work sometimes and not work sometimes yeah. versus you have to be more intentional, right? Yeah. And I will say that based on those two questions you just asked, I've overlapped each of those. And so, like I told you this morning, I did that, pro- that, I did that task in 15 minutes. A year ago, that task would have taken me in two hours. But I did it in 15 minutes because I used a tool called ChatGPT. And I was able to kind of say, here's an idea that I have. Give me 10 more ideas that are along this line for this school to celebrate their anniversary. And help, you know, here's the, here's the elements that I want to go with. And it generated 10 ideas. I was like, okay, that one's good. I like that one, but I'm going to do these other ideas with that. And so it became a tool. And I would say that using... Uh, tools like ChatGPT, generative AI. I, I use ChatGPT as kind of the, the 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 catch-all, but there's a lot of different tools out there. But using those tools, I'm guessing that I um, somebody challenged me that because I used to say I, I save 15 to 20 hours a week. They actually said, actually, you're not saving that time. You're actually being able to do more in that time. So I probably get in about 60 hours worth of week work a week in 40 hours now. And so that's how that's helped me kind of manage my time is that I'm actually able to do more work in the same amount of time. What do you think is either, I don't know, the biggest misconception or just why do you think that more people aren't 
we'll call it early adopters of it within the higher ed space? I think I think it has to do with several things. I mean, one, you, you mentioned it's the adoption curve. I mean, there's the standard adoption curve. And right now we're still ramping up to the top. Um, but I also think that there's just a general illiteracy around technology and around AI. I think a lot of people are quick to dismiss it because they they think too hard about it. It's like, oh, you know what? This is uh, this is wrong. It's it's not ethical because they're scraping this information on the internet. Well, if you really think about it, I mean, a lot of people think of of AI the way they think about Google search that it's just going out and you know sucking all this information and then just spitting that information back out, but to really understand what generative AI is, you have to kind of think about the fact that they've actually programmed a brain and they've done neural networks now, which is new technology. I heard the other day that chat GPT only has 2000 lines of code, but because it's built on this neural network and this neural network is basically, you know, has thought processes just like a human brain. And so to, for people to say, well, that's not, you know, it's just uh, regurgitating things. Well, isn't that what we all do? Don't we all learn? Isn't that the point of higher education? We learn so that we can then recreate something new. And, you know, there's the old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. And we all know that that's true. But at the same time, when we look at a tool that's doing that, we get really skeptical and say, well, that's, that's just, uh, you know, that's, that's not copyright you know, friendly. It's like, well, actually you look at all the different artists out there. I mean, how many, how many works by, you know, famous artists are derivative of something else that, you know, came in the past or writers that are, that are derivative of something else. This tool is just a way that things are getting derivative through a computer. Change literally is inevitable. And if you don't change, you're not growing. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of growth is change. And uh, I had a conversation this morning that that is interesting because my my prediction. Somebody's asking me recently about predictions, and I think you know if you thought twenty twenty three was a lot of change, twenty twenty four is going to be even more. And I think that what's going to happen, and I'm already starting to see this, is that change management is going to become the thing that leadership has to deal with. And I think that um, uh, right now, uh, in much of our world, especially in higher ed, I think you've got a lot of senior leadership, administrators, board members that are that are older, they're boomers that just really are not wanting to embrace change and change management. And I think that that's going to become overwhelming in the next 18 to 24 months. And I think we're going to have a vacuum of leadership because a lot of people are going to be like, I just, I don't have it in me anymore, or I don't want to do it anymore, or I've got this gig over here that somebody wants me to consult, or I'm just ready to go play golf. And I think you're going to have a lot of people that just decide, you know, I'm done. I'm punching my ticket. And we're going to have a lot of, a lot of change in, in not only the world, but leadership in higher ed. And I think that's going to be even more challenging going into the enrollment cliff, going into the misconceptions about the value of higher ed with AI. There's, there's going to be a lot of challenges. And so I appreciate you talking about change because I think that is something that if you are change adverse, now would be the time to start flexing that muscle and kind of putting in your reps to kind of get used to change and either figure out a strategy for it or, or, or surround yourself with some people, just start having some on, honest conversations around it. Well, that's step one, I think is, you know, you have to have honest conversations, not only within yourself, but with other people, if you're going to make changes. Right. And, and I think for me, it comes back to our mindset, right? I didn't understand Bard in my early 20s, the power of mindset, but I fully, I promise you understand it now as I am in my late 40s, which is you surround yourself with more negative content, more negative people, you're more change averse, you hear about it all the time, you're going to take on a lot of those. It's just the way our brains work. Psychologists have proven that over and over and over again. I hope if nothing else, what the audience takes away from all of that is you have to start somewhere. Whether it's AI, whether it's time management, whether it's I want to figure out what I need to change or where my opportunities are for growth, well, we'll then start small, talk to people, do some self-reflection, but do something is the point. Don't just keep thinking about it and talking about it. Right, right. I've heard you use this term mission fit storytelling. I know you're not the only one to use it, but define what that means for us, Bart. Yeah, so... Two, two elements there. Let's talk first about mission fit. I believe that every college has a mission. 
and you might have that written down someplace. It might just be part of the ethos. It might just be defining who you are. You know, Purdue University has a mission of engineering. You know, uh, there are faith-based schools that might use the word mission quite differently than than maybe a, a flagship state university might. But everybody has a, a direction and a mission that they're going. And I believe that out there amongst all of the you know, prospective students, there are students that are going to fit better at your institution because their personal mission aligns with your institution's mission. And I I think that identifying that mission fit is really where the future of, of higher ed marketing needs to go. I really think that if you can identify those mission fit students and then start marketing to them and and marketing through storytelling to be able to say, okay, let me tell you the story of other students like you who are a few years ahead of where you were, but at one point they were exactly where you are. This was the thoughts, the feelings, the, the emotions that they had. And we're going to tap into that because those are the same thoughts and feelings and emotions that you have. And now all of a sudden we create this synergy and, and rather than just delivering facts and, and, you know, catalog content about our institution, we're actually engaging with someone at a very emotional level. I was talking to another person today about just the the right brain, left brain thing and and all the research that goes into that. And I think that as much as we know that sometimes we still fall back onto, well, let's just kind of talk about the features. You know, here's what, you know, here's the 97 programs that we offer and here's the, you know, different ways of, and, and it's basically gets a recital of the catalog, the course catalog that's very academic. And we lose that opportunity to really connect with somebody emotionally. I still believe that most decisions are made based on emotions and then we justify them with logic. And that's no different in the way our prospective students look and, and engage. And so we have to be able to tell the stories that engage people emotionally. And, and, and on top of that, we have to make sure that when we present whatever information, we're presenting it from an emotional lens and then still having the data and the information there, but we've got to, we've got to lead with emotion. I just think that that's one of the biggest fallacies that are, that's missing in a lot of higher ed marketing is that we just, we just lead with facts. And I wonder, Bart, is part of the problem with so many schools not being able to identify, quote unquote, the best fit students twofold, right? Number one, they're marketing to everybody. And as mm-hmm. we've already established and you've hit on, you're not going to be a you know good fit for every single student out there. It's about identifying the ones that fit best. But then how much of it also is a lot of these students, they don't know what fit means at 17 and 18. And so how much of it is, well, then it's on the college or it's on somebody else in their life to kind of guide them down that path and to lead the conversation to your point through different types of messaging, through different content on your website, like just any thoughts on all of that? Yeah. And I I think it goes back to, you know, you and I talked at lunch about this, that I think that there's still this hesitancy in higher ed to speak of ourselves as businesses. And so if I look at the, you know, Microsoft doesn't have any problem selling, you know, uh, selling their Xbox to 15, 16, 17, 18 year old males. They understand what it is that those prospective buyers want. They deliver on that and they target their advertising to that particular audience because they know that, you know, Call of Duty is going to, it's going to be a certain niche audience that they're going to go after. They're not broadcasting Call of Duty to, you know, mom in, you know, better homes and gardens. I mean, they know their audience and they go after them and they, and they do that well. And they also know that they are going to advertise that in influencer space, or they might also have a larger broad, broad space. But so you might see that on an, on an NFL game, or you might see it someplace else, but I know that they're spending a lot more advertising in places that I'm not in because that I'm not the target audience. And so I think that because we don't fully embrace business thinking, and we try to still kind of keep this uh, academic perspective of, you know, well, we're an institution, we don't need to sell and we don't need to do this. And I, I think there's still enough of that hanging around that we don't get as focused in our efforts, for, whether it be marketing or, or I'm going to use the word sales. I know that was a even worse word sometimes, but I mean, to look at our enrollment teams and not see them as true salespeople and maybe even give them some sales training. I mean, I'm often amazed, and and I think you and I might have even talked about this at lunch, that we often put the largest decision that that a young person will make, actually the largest investment that they might make in their entire life, 
we often, you know, the, the person who sells that is someone who's usually about four years older than that person with very little sales training and a huge job and a very low salary. And, and it's, it's one of those things where then we sit back and we say, well, why isn't this working? Well, you know, th- there's a lot of reasons why it's not working and I'm not trying to, you know, up end and change everything. And please don't, you know, get caught up on some of the details that I'm talking about, but I don't think that that would ever happen at like a, a Lexus dealership. Or that wouldn't happen at other places that that you have a equal size, you know, of a of an investment. I think that sometimes we miss we miss the opportunities to do some proven basic business principles that that because we think that that doesn't fit academia, and and I think that's that's a that's often very sad. Well, and so much of it, to your point, could be figured out if we would do more. We'll call it market research, right? To use a yeah. business term. And by that is just understanding that, you know, your local students, your out-of-state students, your students of color, your first-gen students, they all may have things that align with your institution and things they value, but they don't all value the same things at the end of the day. But we need to define those and then we need to market based on what we continue to see, right? I can't remember where I read it a couple of years ago, but Disney started marketing to parents who want to go to Disney without their kids. Like that yeah. is big now kind of become a thing, but what that segment wants out of their experience when they go to a Disney park is totally different than a family that goes to a Disney park with one, two, three, multiple kids. Yeah. Right. And that's why things like persona exercises are so important because you start to identify who, who are those people and what is it that they're looking that will help them move the needle. And so just like you said, I mean, it's one thing to have your messaging all about, you know, family memories. But if mom and dad want to get off without the kids, then all of a sudden it's going to be a different messaging. It's still going to be family oriented, but it might be more date night type of messaging. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that that uh, we can kind of look at the the playbooks. I always like list, looking at Disney and Target and some of the the larger corporations that I think do a very good job of of marketing to their niche audiences and and kind of looking at that and saying, you know what, maybe I can learn something from them and maybe I can apply that to higher education. And I, and I think that's a, that's a skill set that any of us can do is if we're just be observers to what's around us. We talked about audiences earlier when we were talking just about, you know, understanding mission fit, what types of students would do well at your institution is, is first generation students. And not only are you a first generation college student, as I've learned through our conversations, but that's a huge, fast growing population in the United States. Talk to me a little bit, just as you have conversations um, or even through your personal experiences, Bart, what do you do, if anything, differently if you work in admissions or enrollment marketing when it comes to trying to create conversations, learn more about students who might be first generation students, and then just the types of conversations you might have with them. Just any thoughts on any of that? Um, I think you have to assume that they don't know hardly anything. When I was a senior in high school, I was a first gen student. There were two schools that I knew of. I, I grew up in Anderson, Indiana. So there was Anderson University and there was Ball State University, which were you know within 20 or 30 minutes. So that was kind of my, that's what I knew. And uh, I assumed that if I was going to go to college, it would be one of those schools. Um, I really wanted to go to the, to the Anderson university, but I mean, it was, you know, my parents worked in the factory. We didn't have a lot of money. And all I was told was that's really expensive to go to that school and you, you're not going to be able to do that. And I remember coming home one day from school and my mom had left a note on the counter with a clipping from the newspaper and, you know, a family friend, it was announced in the newspaper that had just received the, you know, presidential scholarship from Anderson University, a new scholarship that they were offering for academics and, and, uh, and, and other things. And so she said, you need to find out about that. So, I mean, I didn't know any better. I, I, I just called the university and said, can I come over and, and talk about this scholarship? And, um, you know, I, I, I knew that, you know, I needed to get my suit on. And I, so I went over there like it was a job interview. I mean, I think back now and I look at it and I was like, it was a campus visit is what it was, but I didn't know, I didn't know any better. And I had scheduled a call with the admissions director over Christmas holiday. And I'm the only one in there and I'm trying to sell on why I would really like to come to Anderson university. And, uh, uh, you know, I said, well, why don't you apply? And I mean, I didn't know the first thing about, you know, anything. And so when I look back at it and I think about, you know, all the things that sometimes we assume that kids know, that we, th- we think that they know what it means to apply to school, we think that they know what it means to do this. I mean, I did not have a very good, you know, school 
guidance department either. And so a lot of times we think, well, these people will just talk to their school counselor. Well, they might not even know to do that. And so I think that we make too many assumptions sometimes. And even things like the way that you present the tuition on the page, I mean, it just drives me crazy when I see schools that offer it in, in credit cost per credit hour. I mean, I just don't think that anybody other than academics really understands that. Doing math is and, not good, right, Bart? No, exactly. I don't want to do math. I'm trying to get into, you know, figure out if I can afford something. And I often joke to, with people, it's like going to a furniture store and wanting to buy a dining room table and having it priced per square foot. It's like, I have no clue how many square feet a dining room table is. I could figure it out. But I just want to know, can I afford it? And then when you start telling me, well, that's the cost of the table, we forgot to tell you that the chairs cost this. And if you want this on top of that, then that's going to be extra. And by the way, if you want the leaf, that's an extra. I don't just tell me what it takes me to get what I need. And so I think that um, I think sometimes we've got to take a step back and say, what do we need to communicate, whether it's on our website, whether it's on our communications or whether it's just in the way that we talk at a college fair? How do we need to present this information? And it, I'm a big believer, and I, I work with a lot of schools where we'll put together first-generation brochures or parent brochures so that we can help unpack this in a very you know, non-threatening way. And, and I think especially as we get into the enrollment cliff where we're going to have a lot more first-generation students that are of either um, Hispanic or Latino background, because that's going to be the fastest growing area. If we don't have materials that are focused on the parents that are in Spanish, we are missing a boat. And it's not as simple as just going to your Spanish professor and saying, translate this. You have to translate it in a cultural way in addition to the, the language. There's got to be a lot more you know, things that are done for the first generation students and these uh, emerging uh, demographics. It's got to be more than just lip service and, and a few boxes checked. We, we've got to rethink the way that we're approaching this market. And so again, it goes back to our personas. It goes back to change. But I do think that there's a lot of opportunity for those schools that can do it and do it well. I was talking to John McGill, and uh, and I think you know him well, Jeremy. And uh, he was talking about the importance of putting the counseling back in admissions counseling. I think we've gotten kind of misled sometimes that, okay, we're recruiting, we're doing this, and we kind of turn it into this machine, as opposed to that counseling that says, I'm going to actually help walk alongside you to help you get to your goals. And, and sometimes that might be our institution. Sometimes it might not be, but I'm going to, I'm going to provide and invest in you to, to help you achieve your goals. And I think we need to do more of that. Bart, what do you think the biggest communication skill is that young professionals just all across the world probably need to improve on? Being curious. And I think being curious then makes you be a better listener. And it makes you be a better person to have a conversation with. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm thinking about a young admissions professional and they sit down with a family, if you started with curiosity, you could get exactly where you needed to be in that meeting. And you could really do some really good things with that because that's going to get you to start asking the why questions. It's like, oh, I hear you want to, you know, I hear you're interested in our, in our biomed program. Why is that? Well, as soon as they tell you why, you have a wealth of information to take the conversation to the next level. And then it's like, okay, what schools are you looking at and, and why are you looking at those schools? Now you've got a whole nother wealth of information. And so I think that idea, and I, I love Simon Sinek and, and his, his, you know, the power of why, I think that's where curiosity starts. And, and I think that to ask the questions and then hear the why, and then be able to listen well enough to be able to say, how can I then take what I just learned and take that to the next level? I think that's a skill that um, any young professional, if, if you could learn to do that and even practice amongst yourselves when you're at lunch, you're going to be a better um, communicator. You're going to be a, a more interesting conversationalist, and you're going to be somebody that can be trusted. And I think that's one of the things that needs to be going into where we are going with, with enrollment. Trust is something that we have to learn to earn, and it's something that does not come cheap. So much great stuff there. And I think there's going to be a lot of good takeaways as the audience listens to this part. I end every episode with something I call fun rapid fire. So I'm just going to give you a handful of things and I just want some quick feedback for you on each one. Okay. Perfect. Your biggest pet peeve is what? Uh, cost per credit hour on your website. <laughs> what was the last thing you Googled that you remember? 
Um, oh my gosh. Uh, it, actually, it was maps of people that I was sending out uh, thank you notes to. Best Christmas gift your kids ever got you. Oh, jeez. Man, these are these are really good. I wish I would have had them earlier. Um, best Christmas kid, my First thing that came to mind. First thing that came to mind is uh, a lot of books. I love books. Your favorite baseball player, who is it, past or present? A guy by the name of Os Kaler started the uh, Cincinnati Reds and he back in the 1860s, and he's like a great, 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 great uncle of mine. Who's your favorite podcaster right now, Bart? My favorite podcaster right now. Oh, my goodness. Um, I like Jamie Hunt's show. I I listen to hers, and I I think she does a great job. Jamie does an amazing job, and I've had the pleasure of her joining me as well on the pod. And last one. You've heard this one before, I'm sure, but if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, boy. Um, First name that popped into my head was Theodore Roosevelt. I, I've always enjoyed reading his biographies, and he was a pretty dynamic inv- individual. Appreciate you playing along there, and just so much of what you shared today, I think, will be helpful for the audience. And you know, take away as much as you can, but take something away not only from what Bart shared today, but as you are listening to other podcasts, reading whatever you do when it comes to professional development, I just really encourage you to take something and put it into action. Bart, happy holidays, my friend. And I look forward to the next time that we connect. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Mission Admissions with Jeremy Tears. If you like this episode, do us a huge favor and hit that follow and subscribe button below. Furthermore, if you've got just two minutes to spare, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a rating and a review of this show on Apple Podcasts. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. But Enrollify is far more than just a podcast network. Enrollify is where higher ed comes to learn new marketing skills, discover new products and services, and find their next job. We're a growing, learning community of 4,000 members, and we'd love to welcome you into the fold. You can access our free blog articles, newsletters, e-courses, and more, or purchase our master course on how to market a university with Terry Flannery at enrollify.org. We look forward to meeting you soon and welcoming you into the community. Again, you can subscribe for free at enrollify.org.